All right, it's 5.30, so we've got quite a few people tuning in here. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Ray Ward of Ward Labs join us. Um, it's going to be a little bit different than in previous weeks in the sense of I'm going to let Ray uh, and Keith kind of have a conversation here. We do have some topics that we want to hit, and we're going to let Keith kind of guide that conversation for that. In the meantime, you guys are all going to be muted, but if you do have questions, you can go ahead and type those in in the, the chat bar and see if that works. Um, we'll probably go until about 6.15, I think. And from there, we'll open it up to those audience questions. So, um, Ray, I'm looking here for your intro and hopefully I, okay, yep, here it is. So Dr. Ray Ward is president of, and co-owner of Ward Laboratories. He is a certified professional agronomist, a certified soil scientist and certified crop advisor with a PhD in soil fertility from South Dakota State University in 1972. He has a BS and MS degrees from University of Nebraska in 1959 and 1961. Before founding Ward Labs in Kearney, he served as a lab division manager of Cervatech in Dodge City, Kansas was an associate professor at Oklahoma State University and assistant professor and instructor at South Dakota State University. He holds numerous memberships in scientific and honorary academic societies and organizations and has received many awards, including the Soil Science Industry Award and Soil Science Professional Service Award from the Soil Science Society of America in 2005 a whole list of awards. Um, one of my favorites is the 2019 No-Till Innovator Award from No-Till Farmer. His goals for agriculture and agronomy are here to help production agriculture use its resources as effectively as possible to provide information and data for developing soil health for the best use of soil and water resources while maintaining environmental quality to be involved in value-added agriculture and to provide accurate laboratory data for managing production enterprises. So obviously, Ray is bringing a wealth of knowledge and expertise with us tonight. Ray, thank you so much for joining. Um, with that, I guess, Keith, I'll pass it over to you and let you kind of guide the conversation here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Noah. Uh, Ray, I've been looking forward to this, like I told you, ever since we scheduled it. Uh, I've been thinking about some of the conversations that I wanted to have with you and uh, just really looking forward to it. Uh, we've known each other fairly well pro for probably close to 20 years. I uh, kind of got to know Ray through the No-Till on the Plains organization uh, when we first started doing that. And then uh, as we got more involved and as we started Green Cover Seed, we've been on, I don't know how many, Ray, how many times we've both been speaking at the same event, which is always fun. Uh, one of my fondest memories of Ray is uh, on the South Dakota bus tours, the No-Till on the Plains bus tours, uh, when Ray would be on the bus and would just be talking about soils and different things and uh, just a tremendous uh, wealth of information uh, when it comes to that. So, uh, Ray, I just, I just want to start out with this. You know, one of the things that I admire most about you, I mean, it's, you know, everybody knows you're a great soil scientist and have been, you know, in, the, in that industry uh, for a long, long time. But one of the things that really impresses me is the changes that I've seen in you uh, over the last probably 10, 15 years of, of going from just kind of that traditional soil scientist with an emphasis on the chemical and the physical properties of the soil to really being a, a very passionate uh, proponent of the biological component of the soil as well. So tell us a little bit about the journey that, that you've been on that took you not that, not that you're going away from the chemical and the physical, but incorporating the biological components as well. Tell us a little bit about how you got to that point. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting story, Keith. And, and I was pretty much, a, at one time, when we started Ward Laboratories, uh, I thought, I even thought uh, strip till or in uh, ridge till would come back to soil and you'd have to do deep tillage. And the University of Nebraska come out here and did some deep chiseling and never got any yield response. And so it kind of makes you wonder what's going on because we we kind of, we knew the soil compaction was a big problem and all those things. And and then the no-till in the plains got me involved in the tours up to South Dakota. And of course I knew Dwayne Beck and all the strange things he was doing. And <laughs> I just, I, you know, I couldn't figure out how that could happen. But, it, but over time, I just, you know, I saw enough talking to you guys and 
And uh, then the real conversion occurred in 1992 when I was visiting Martin Jorgensen at uh, Ideal South Dakota. And uh, it was it was quite a quite an interesting revelation that when I was at South Dakota State in the 60s as all summer fellow, winter wheat land. And when I met him in 92, he had said, we can't hardly afford to grow wheat anymore and we're cropping every year. And it just really uh, struck me that I need to change the way we're doing things. So so that's kind of how that journey started in the no-till. And then, then we'd go to the meetings in Salina and you know, no-till and we're doing this and it's wonderful. And and then Dwayne Beck would come up and say, now we, we have to have a stacked rotation. He'd say, what the heck is that? <laughs> And we got that figured out, and then he said, "Now you got to have cover crops." And and uh, in that time frame, then meeting some, you know, Jill Clapperton and some of the other folks, uh, Jill finally talked me into getting involved in testing. And we started with that phospholipid fatty acid test in 2011, and then and then that's when uh, when I really then then I heard that Ray Archuleta said Ray Ward needs to do this Haney testing. And so then in, in 2013, we got started with the Haney test. And it's really changed my mind on, on what we're doing to the land and how we're treating the land. And, and it's, um, it's a learning almost every day, Keith, that you yeah. pick up something new. And it's just been pretty darn exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's been a great journey. Tell a little bit about, and I didn't get to go see this, but I know I've heard you say this numerous times. Uh, and I think it was in 2006. I believe you were on the bus tour that went up to uh, Burley County, and that's when Jay and Gabe and those guys had planted those first multi-species cover crops, and they were in that terrible, severe drought. And you guys got off the bus, and all of those monoculture plots were all dried up, and then the the, the diverse mix was really doing well. Tell tell a little bit about that, because I, I love hearing you tell about that story, partially because I didn't get to go and see that, so I like hearing other people talk about it. But was that a big turning point for you as well? It, it was, it was unbelievable. I just, you know, if I hadn't seen it, I don't know if I would uh, believe it today yet because it was just so extreme. And I know a game shows that picture once in a while, but uh, those things were about two inches tall and dried up. And yet when they mixed 11 or 12 things together, the turnips were about an inch and a half in diameter. Lupins are blooming. And they said that the roots kind of interchanged and the plants were trading all these things. And my kind of knowledge of stuff, I, I couldn't understand how a biological system would connect cells together from one plant to another. And, and it, but it got me thinking, and then you, you guys repeated the next, the next year, the same thing down at your farm with uh, the, the moisture meters and how the moisture went down where you had a single crop and we had to mold the crop, the moisture stayed up high. And yeah. It just really, you know, really makes you wonder what the heck's going on. And then luckily, my kids bought me a soil book for Christmas one year and had a f kind of a funny joke, but there are little stories in it. And then there was a forester that was tracing carbon-14 in a tree. In, in a, and he, co so he covered it with plastic. And then he went around trying to find all the carbon-14 and he couldn't account for all of it. And he finally found uh, an aspen tree nearby that had carbon-14 in it. And then he explained that the mycorrhiza was joining you know, the two trees together. And, that, and that's how I figured out then it's a mycorrhiza that's trading this stuff, not the plant roots themselves. Yeah. And that really hits you up with the biological system. And, and, then, and then all this stuff with the PLFA and the Haney is just starting to fit together on what, what's going on. Yeah, so so in other words, your life would have been a whole lot easier if you had never heard of Dwayne Beck or Jill Clapperton or Rick Haney or any of these people because because uh, every time that you hear these folks, uh, you know, you're the kind of guy that isn't satisfied staying where you're at. You want to go to that next step and learn that next thing and even better provide those tests for the rest of us that we can send in. So you mentioned this briefly earlier and I want to go go there and have you kind of explain a little bit to folks. I, I don't think we need to explain to people what a traditional soil test is, you know, testing for NPK and 
and all of that. I think everybody is, is pretty well understands that. But go ahead and talk a little bit about the PLFA test, which you mentioned that, that you uh, uh, developed in conjunction with Jill Clapperton. And then also talk about the Haney soil test uh, and, and tell a little bit about what those things are testing. When should they be used? Uh, how are they different? And just how do you see people best utilizing those biological tests? Okay, the, the PLFA test, the phospholipid fatty acid test, the one, the one that we're doing is that we, we get the soil in, it has to come in in a, a cool package, and then we take that soil and we freeze dry it. And, and uh, so that, because we're, t the phospholipid fatty acids are in the perimeter of the, of the microbial cells. And it's in, the, in that out, outside wall and we save that fatty acid through the freeze drying. We extract that and then determine the, the fatty acid on the gas schematograph. And, and then the certain microbes have certain number of, uh, of the fatty acids. And so you can group the microbes together in the in the bacteria and fungi and the protozoa. But, uh, but on the, the I like the, the first of the report is uh, microbial biomass, which gives you some idea of how much microbial biomass is there. And then the diversity is, a, is the next part that I look at because uh, the more diverse your, your system is, the more help you're going to get from the microbes in, in the, your cropping system. Gram positive, gram negative, bacteria, the gram positives are, and, I, and I'm not a microbiologist, so I don't understand this stuff very well, but the gram positives are the ones that grow in, in, when you have good conditions. And, and uh, you kind of want to balance between the gram positive and gram negatives. If the ratio is between one and two, then that's a good, good balance. If, if you have uh, the higher ratio of gram positive to gram negatives, it means that things are really in great shape and, and the gram positive are really growing fast. And, and uh, so, so that diversity uh, is there a little bit. And then you look at the fungi, and, they, and of course the fungi are the ones that are making the glues that glue the sand, silt, and clay particles together to make soil aggregates, to make the granular structure that we have in the soil. And, and so I like, really like to look at those. And, and then the gram, and then we do a, a fungi to bacteria ratio. And, and ideally, I'd like to see that about 0.3 if you could get it that way. And my, my example is uh, I wanted to prove that anhydrous ammonia wasn't hurting the soil. And so I, I took a phospholipid fatty acid on the side where we put ammonia on and on the other side didn't put ammonia on because they're changing our cropping. And when I got done, uh, my microbial biomass is 40% less on the anhydrous ammonia side than it was on the non-ammonia side. And, and then, uh, Sorry about that phone, but um, then I looked at the fungi to bacteria ratio and where I had nitrogen on, where I had ammonia on, the ratio was narrower than it was, or lower, if you say that way. So it was a, almost less than, it was about, it was a little less than point, point 0.1 and point zero 0.09, and uh, where, whereas no ammonia is on is about 1 point, or point 0.11. And then in the field adjacent that I had winter wheat and I had a molecule of a crop on. And so that fall I took a sample there and I had a, my, a diversity of a 1.6, which is great diversity. And, and now I'm walking through the lab about a year ago. I, I finally figured out why you have cover crops. Because microbes are really small and I read somewhere that their, half, their life is about 30, 30 minutes or something. But if you don't have a plant growing, then they're, they don't have food. Yeah. So they're sitting there waiting for somebody to feed them and you don't get anything done. So the cover crop is a, a source of food for the microbes in addition to some of the uh, nutrient cycling we're gonna talk about. But, and then, uh, you know, just, just looking at that, it just tells you what the life in the soil is like and how you might do some things to change that. And, and uh, we, have, we have some people that are very strong on the fossil lipid fatty acid test, and then there's some curiosity seeing what's going on. So we, we have all that diversity. And then the Haney test, we do that CO2 respiration, which 
tells you, that it gives you a good idea what the microbial biomass is. Doesn't tell you the ratios or anything like that, but, but it gives you an idea if you got life in the soil. And then the next thing you do is we do a water extract from that. And, and that respiration is a 24 hour test. We dry the soil like we're doing the regular testing. And then we uh, dry it and grind it. And then we extract the, uh, I, sh I should say not extract, but weigh out 40 grams of the soil, wet, wet it and then seal it and then measure the carbon dioxide produced in 24 hours. And it's uh, the bacteria, some of them come alive when they get water and they go around eating their buddies and that's how they get the CO2 because they're, they're doing that. So that gives us an idea of the microbial biomass. And then we do the water extract, which is kind of the, the carbon that's in the water and the nitrogen in the water, those are the foods for the microbes because they live in those water films around the salt particles. And, and uh, if you have enough carbon, then, uh, then you have food for the microbes and then you have to look at the nitrogen to see if they have enough protein to balance a carbohydrate, so to speak. So you have that. So on the food, we'd like to have the, the carbon, ideally, twice as high as the CO2 respiration. Keith, that's one of those little things you can look at. I got a, I got a 60 uh, CO2 and I got 120 carbon. That's great, great shape. Then you look at my carbon nitrogen ratio and, and on the water extract, the carbon nitrogen ratio, and if it's 10 to one, it means I got a really a good protein balance there, which is ideal again. And, and that's uh, then, then those, those units are used to calculate soil health. And of course, the higher the CO2, the higher the carbon, the higher the, and, and then the closer you are to the 10 to one, the better the soil health score is. So uh, there's, I can talk all day on this. So I better let you ask another question. Sure. So, so the, the end result of the Haney test is you get a, a soil health score. Um, do you see when people send in samples, are they requesting a PLFA and a Haney test or do they typically choose one or the other? Uh, we get, we get more choosing a soil health, any test plus regular soil fertility, uh, and and uh, so they, you know, I guess for that comparison, uh, the the PLFA test is eighty dollars per sample, so that discourages some testing, mm -hmm. and uh, for that standpoint, uh, and then we have we have a little problem in the laboratory because we can run about forty or fifty PLFAs a day, and we can run one hundred and fifty Haney's or maybe more than we can run a couple thousand regular soil samples. So, so there's some issues there on how to get all this work done. But, sure. but uh, if, you're, if you're trying to understand this soil health, I think both those tests are really important. And the other part of the Haney test I didn't mention is that H, we have an H3 extract, which is a three organic acids that plant roots exude out or leak out to feed microbes. And so that we're mimicking nature in extracting nitrogen or extracting nutrients. We're doing ammonia nitrate for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, manganese, copper. So we get all that fertility with those three organic acids, which then we can make fertilizer recommendations. Or you know, we can make nutrient recommendations. I say fertilizer, but I recommend pounds of N, P, and K. I don't care what fertilizer you use to get those, but kind of give you an idea of what you need to do to right and that's, that's kind of the next thing about the haney test is it's it, it's going to give you a more accurate indication of what you have there for nutrients based on biology more much more so than a traditional chemistry test correct uh, correct and, and then i think one of the things that people say that if they get a healthy soil their soil tests go up and and the, all the all the the microbes are, are uh, working to make, make those nutrients soluble that you've been putting on. And it kind of makes sense that if you have better life in the soil, you're gonna have more nutrients. And so you can yeah. reduce your inputs, but you still gotta consider the nutrients that you're taking off and how much you're putting back on. Sure. So, all that, yeah. so I would assume that, you know, the vast majority of the tests that you get in and get in are coming off of crop ground, but talk a little bit about, do you get people sending in soil samples from grasslands or rangeland and are they looking at the Haney or a PLFA to you know just kind of give an indication of the 
soil health and range because a lot of times that gets ignored, you know, but there's lots of acres of grass out there that shouldn't be ignored. I know, and it's uh, one of those things that I think is, as agronomists, we ought to talk a little bit more about it because half our land is in grass, native grasses or mm -hmm. perennial grasses. And we, we don't get very many of those uh, samples in. We, we get them in there probably usually from smaller farmers that are sampling a, a, a grassland that they have a comparison with their cropping land. But uh, I see a lot of uh, mismanaged range or pasture and, and uh, I, we really got to spend a little bit of time on, on uh, trying to do a better job of producing grass. What worries me, Keith, is that over time, if we keep mismanaging, we would destroy the root system on these native grass or, or perennial grasses. And, he, and then we get a dry period, we're not gonna have any production and we're gonna have to buy a lot more hay to keep our cows alive and all that, those kind of things. So, yeah, we're, we're, the other thing that happens is the productivity on that goes down and down and down. And pretty soon the guy says, well, I can't make any of your money growing grass. I just will tear it out and try to grow corn. Yeah, that's it. And that, that happens way too often. And the last thing we need is more acres growing corn right now. That's right, that's right. So you talked a little bit about when, when you send in a sample for the PLFA, uh, you need to send it in kind of a, a cool cool box of some sort. You don't want that getting too hot. Is that the same for a Haney test too? Or how should people prepare for that? I, and I'm guessing that there's instructions on the Ward Lab website if they want to learn more about that. but. Just briefly tell us how, how we should prepare these things to send them in. You know, on, the, on the PLFA, we need to, need to have, a, you know, in, in, a, in a plastic bag so that uh, you know, our soil bags are plastic lined, the paper bags, and, and or a Ziploc bag, and they need to retain the moisture. We don't want those samples to dry out. Okay, so seal and them up. And seal them up and then, then send them in a the cooler. You could have an ice pack in there. We've, we've gotten a couple times we've got with ice, don't put ice in there because it melts and then you got mud instead of a good soil sample. Mm -hmm. But uh, an ice pack, or if it's cool when you send, you could you refrigerate them in the night, you know, send them the next day, uh, that would be good in the cooler. And then uh, if you're far away, you probably want to send like two day, one day or two day time. Uh, and, and then on the Haney test or a regular fertility, we, we say just, package those up and send them. Don't put them on your desk, wait, wait, and think I'll get it done tomorrow. Because <laughs> they, will, they will change over time, but, but uh, if, you, if you can, you got two or three days that you can get them shipped and there won't be any problem. And, and so then we get the Haney in, the, the Haney, Haney soil health test, and we dry those at 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, sorry, Jimmy, I, I call it a Kansas drying room instead of a Oklahoma, but <laughs> it's 110 and the wind's blowing. But uh, that's how we dry the sample overnight so we can grind and prepare the, the sample. So, so PLFA, you have to handle carefully the, the Haney or regular test, not so much. Okay, okay. okay. That, yeah, that's good to know. Um, and, 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 and Keith, I'll just say this. I, I would encourage uh, shipping with the UPS or FedEx uh, sometimes the post office isn't very fast. So I'll just say that. Yeah, I would not disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to move shift, shift topics here just a little bit from soil testing to testing of uh, plants and specifically of cover crops because and I, you know, you and I have had this conversation many times uh, throughout the years and I, I want to share some of your insights into this with, with our with our customers and our followers here. One of the most often questions that we get from people that plant a diverse cover crop mix, you know, like, like what you see behind me here or, you know, anything, especially that has legumes in it, they always ask, well, how much nitrogen am I gonna get from growing this, this cover crop mix? And, you know, that, that's always really hard to, to answer um, because it, you know, well, it, it's not hard to answer because the answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of different things. So talk briefly about what some of those factors are that will influence how much nitrogen we'd get out of a mix like this. And then I've got, um, I've got some pictures that I want to show. So you kind of, kind of give the background and then I've got some pictures to show of some clippings that we just took just last week. We sent them into your lab. You got them tested. We can look at the cover crop. 
and then we'll look at the test results and you can explain to people how to interpret or read one of these test results from testing of cover crops. Okay, so it's the, the cover crop thing to, to understand the nutrient cycling and understand the uh, most important part is having food going to the microbes in the soil, but, but it's also a way to retain, stop leaching of, of nutrients or nitrogen and sulfur. But uh, what we do, what I encourage you to do um, is take a yard square or something like that, you, you know. And I thought well, we had a clippers down your place and we harvested the area and chopped mm -hmm. it up and took those things home that time. But uh, take a yard square, stuff all that stuff in a plastic garbage bag and you can send that to us and we'll chop that up, get a sample out of it and we'll weigh it, of course, chop it up, get a sample, represent a sample out and then we'll uh, analyze the plant nutrients nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, well, I'll start with carbon too. And, and on down the line, you get all the nutrients. And then uh, if we know the area, like the yard square, nine square feet, and then, then the computer will calculate out of the pounds with the dry matter, tons per acre, and then the pounds of nutrients per, per acre. And, and then the, we can also calculate the carbon nitrogen ratio. And, and that tells us then how fast we're gonna get the nitrogen out of that and all the other nutrients, of course, but nitrogen is an important one that we, we look at. But, but the plant has all those nutrients in it, and so we can measure all those. Um, yeah, Keith, Keith, you got a, a picture of? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me share my screen here. OK, can you see this picture of the tractor? Yes. OK. I, so let me give you just a little history of this. This So this field um, is here at our house. And uh, last year we had spring triticale growing on this. Um, we harvested that the mid to the end of July last year. And then we planted buckwheat as a double crop. Uh, so we planted about 30 pounds of buckwheat uh, along with about 15 pounds of hairy vetch. Uh, we harvested the buckwheat. Um, middle of October for grain, a grain crop, the hairy vetch was down underneath that. And then we interseeded rye into that. And um, this is what we ended up with here. Um, I'm gonna show you this short video clip uh, because this, this is just about the coolest thing that I've seen in a long time. Um, we, we put um, the Dawn ZRX cover crop rollers and we're gonna have we uh, future webinars just about these cover crop rollers and this whole process of planting green into this. Now I will tell you that this was not planted until the first week of June. So this, we had to let this stuff grow out quite a bit longer than we wanted simply because we had such a cold spring uh, that it, it wasn't growing as fast as we wanted there's probably 10 times as much biomass here at the end of May as there was the beginning of May. So if you do this type of thing and you invest in hairy vetch and give up on it too quickly, you're not gonna get your nitrogen back out of it. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you this video and we're, we're planting popcorn into this particular field. Uh, we have some sunflowers planted in this same field also. We're growing all these for seed crops. Uh, I want to show you the video just to show you kind of how it rolled down, what it looked like. And then I'll show you some pictures of some close-ups, show you how we sampled it. Uh, and then we'll look at the actual test results back from Ward Labs and Ray can talk about that a little bit here. So uh, we'll just see if we can run this. So uh, this is what it looked like just rolling through the field and planting. Uh, again, with those Don ZRX rollers. Uh, we did not get, we, did fit, we didn't feel like we got 100% kill on the hairy vetch. So we did end up uh, putting a little uh, Liberty over the top of this to, to knock that out. Uh, but uh, we got 100% kill on the rye with the crimper alone. Uh, but that vetch, there was so much vetch there that we couldn't get enough down pressure. Even though you see all the weights that we have mounted on our planter, we just couldn't get enough down pressure on these units to completely kill that vetch. But we're looking at ways to do that, but I mean, just look at the thatch that that's planting into. Um, the The popcorn was coming up in four or five days, so we got a good stand, we got a good placement. Um, but when it swings around to the side here, um, first of all, look at all the birds flying around. And then if you look real close, you can just see there's just thousands of insects coming up out of this 
Uh, you can kind of see it right there, just the, just a horde of insects uh, because that's such a biologically active soil. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of life in that. And so that was really fun to do. Um, again, this is the first year that we've done it with this particular planter setup. Uh, there's definitely things that we would do differently for next time, but this gives us some good encouragement uh, that, you know, essentially what we're looking at, the, the holy grail of soil health is organic no-till. And so that's what we're trying to accomplish. Now we didn't completely do it because we did have to put a little spray over the top to finish that vetch off. We did, I did have an organic guy that looked at this a week later um, and he said, I think that vetch would have died on its own. I don't think you would have had to spray it because he's got a lot more experience on this than what, than what we do. Um, let's see. So here's, here's what this cover crop looked like. Um, you can see the yardstick in there. So this uh, was 30 inches tall, but if you would have grabbed that vetch, that vetch would have extended out probably four or five feet tall uh, because there was so much to it here. Uh, so lots of biomass there. And then this, this is the portion right here. Uh, we took two different clippings. Uh, Davis, uh, one of our employees went out and took a clipping right here where it was primarily vetch. And then he also took a clipping where it was what he gauged to be about half vetch and half rye. And you can see right here. Uh, so Ray, I'm glad that we did things according to your advice. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it here, but we actually have a one square yard. We just made it out of PVC. Uh, you can just okay. go and get some three quarter inch PVC pipe, uh, get four uh, 90 degree corners and just glue all that together. So we have a one square yard uh, PVC deal that we can just throw down. So you leave, you leave the one edge open so you can slide it in? Um, I'm not, I don't think he did. I think he has to kind of work it down, but that's actually okay. a pretty good idea. Um, I'll have to ask, I think that there's a piece of pipe over here. You just can't see it. Um, I'll have to ask him about that though. Yeah. So anyway, he just clipped everything that was inside that one square yard. Uh, he filled the bag. Now, Ray, you wouldn't, like we were close enough that I actually just uh, gave this to a friend from church who works for you and he took it to the lab. So I gave, I gave you the whole works. <laughs> but if, if I was sending this in and I didn't want to send you this whole bag, how would I, how would I take part of that to send to you and then let you know how much I actually had? Okay. That, that, and that's a very good question. And, and of course to get a representative sample is an important part, but you could weigh that yourself. And then, then put a put your representative sample in that bag so it doesn't lose any moisture. My gosh, my computer wants to do something. So, uh, uh, so, so you could weigh that, and then, and then you could just take out a small portion to send to us. Tell us what the weight was. Now, the problem is that we weigh in grams, and and uh, so we usually, if you got. One pound, that's 454 grams, and we usually go to 0.2 uh, places. But if you, you need something that can measure in uh, pounds and ounces at least. Yeah. So, so that you can get it accurate enough. And then you can just send in a portion of the sample. So, so if I weighed that, and it was, because I think, I think Davis did weigh it, and it was like nine pounds or something like that, I could have said, we clipped a square yard, we had nine pounds, and I'm sending you one pound of it or something yeah. like that. Yeah, then we can, you know, and you got nine pounds versus eight pounds, and that gives you, what, about 15% error just on uh, how close you can get on the weight. So, right, you know, right. we're always trying to eliminate error when you can. So, sorry about right. thinking about the science part of it. So, so, be as accurate as possible. Right, right. Yeah. If you could say nine pounds, two ounces, it'd be great. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in the relationship. So, okay. So basically, folks, this is this is how you would do it. And and if you know, if you ask me the question of how much nitrogen man, am I going to get from my cover crop that I grew, I'm probably going to tell. I can give you a range or an estimate, but the only way to know for sure is to do this right here. You've got to take it when it's kind of at its peak growth. You got to take that clipping and you got to send it in and have it analyzed. And that way, you know for sure. Um, so here here are the the tests, Ray, and I'm just going to kind of let you explain what the different parts of this are, what we're looking at here. Uh, and this was just a standard, I think on your website, it's just called the standard cover crop test. 
we you, we could have got one that had all of the other trace uh, elements, uh, but we just did the carbon and the nitrogen in the biomass because that's okay. really what we were interested in. This one here, Ray, is the one that was mostly vetch. So you can go ahead and talk about this one. Okay. Um, well, you see the carbon there. Um, and then do you have the pounds? And can you, I can't see the bottom. What you, your uh, dry matter was, is it 4.4? Yeah, it's 4.4 tons, four, four tons of dry matter. So you got 3,600 pounds of carbon in there and 227 pounds of nitrogen. That's 3,650. Divided by 22 or 227, and uh, the car nitrogen, carbon nitrogen ratio is 16 to one. Now, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that part too. Uh, but so the 16 to one with the vetch, uh, anytime that carbon nitrogen ratio is less than 25 to one, microbes will start decomposing that organic material and releasing nitrogen. If it's above 25 to one, the microbes take nitrogen out of the soil, the nitrate out of the soil to decompose the, the residue until it gets down to 25 to one. You know, it's 16 to one. So as soon as it starts decomposing, you're gonna get quite a bit of nitrogen out of that 227. How much of it are you gonna get out this year? You know, that, I was asked that a long time ago and I said 50%, not knowing it anymore, but. <laughs> It's still a good estimate, and, and uh, with, if you really got good good health in the soil, I think you could get close to 80% of it out of there in that cropping. Uh, the popcorn, uh, is that a long season popcorn? Or you know, if you had 115 day corn, you're probably going to get 75, 80% of that nitrogen out yeah. of there. Yeah, so 80% of that's going to be 181 pounds. That ought to be plenty. Yes. So looking at this picture, you know, when, when I was out there looking at it, Dale and I were out there looking at it, we did not, we were severely, we were pretty close on how much biomass there was. Uh, we severely underestimated how much nitrogen. We were guessing maybe 140 to 180 in there, but that, that's 227 pounds of nitrogen, folks, right there. And uh, again, if I would have taken this clipping May 1st and planted my corn May 1st, my guess is there may have been 40 or 50 pounds. And so if you're going to do this type of thing and try to grow your own nitrogen, you have to be patient. You have to give that cover crop time to do its work and time to grow. Uh, and again, the only sure way to know what you've got is to do a clipping like this. So um, yeah, I would say, I would have thought that that carbon nitrogen ratio would have been a little a little higher, but uh, you know, 16 to one, that stuff's gonna cycle pretty quickly. And, and Ray, what we're gonna do, uh, Dale Strickler and I went out into these fields and we shot some video, um, you know, when things were just recently rolled down. And then we're gonna go out there every two or three weeks and we'll take some more video so we can show people how fast that stuff does really okay. break down. And is this irrigated or dry land? Uh, this is irrigated. Okay, so you kind of kind of keep that in mind because that, if it gets really dry, you won't get decomposition. Yeah, you know, no, we'll, we'll be able to put water on it. So Ray, th this is the second test here. Uh, this is the one that was kind of the rye and vetch blend. It actually didn't have as much tonnage, 3.9 uh, tons of dry matter and 176 pounds of nitrogen, uh, but still very respectable. I mean, that's still plenty. So, so Keith, I just thought of something when looking at this. I, I'm surprised at how high this nitrogen is in that rye and was it just headed or was it blooming yet or is it? Uh, it was, I don't know. And again, you know, we didn't have a great stand of rye, but we didn't plant. We probably only planted 30 pounds of rye okay. middle of October because we knew we wanted the vetch to grow. We didn't want the rye to choke it out. But this rye was, it was pollinating. So it was fully headed and pollinating. There just wasn't a tremendous amount out there. Well, that's probably. So then the, then the. My, my question would be, maybe the fetch was feeding the rye some nitrogen too. Because, because when you look at the results, for those of you that are livestock minded, you take the nitrogen percent times 6.25 and you have protein. So 2.2 so times six is that's 13 and 14% protein. And, and think about how good a forage that would be if you're gonna graze something like that too. Mm -hmm. just 
it's just amazing. So you get you still got a good carbon nitrogen ratio. Yeah. So we we were pretty excited about this. We think that it's going to be you know something that we definitely are going to try to do more of in the future. Um, and you know, stay tuned. It, it's not perfect. Um, I say we did have to wait a long time to plant that corn and we did not wait on all of our corn that long. This was a, you know, about a 40 acre field that we're doing popping sunflowers and we've got our milpa garden mix in there. So uh, we'll kind of see what that looks like. So I, I'm, I'm real curious about some of these things, Keith, because in the, in the carbon nitrogen ratio is 18, 18 to one. So it's still excellent for releasing nitrogen. Yeah. And, and stuff. So, but my dad never planted corn until May 20th. So I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see what you get for yield because I'm curious about the, the planting so early and stuff. But yeah. Uh, um, Ray, just a couple more questions and I think we'll open it up to folks to, to ask questions online here. Um, I know that uh, a number of years ago, I know that we visited about this too. I know you did some testing of cover crops on your farm ground that you have in Saline County. And one of the things that I remember you talking about there in particular was you had one part, and I think this was planted after wheat harvest, you planted one side of the field to a cover crop that was primarily grass with a few broad leaves. And then the other side of the field, you planted to a cover crop mix that was primarily broad leaves with a little bit of grass. And I know you saw quite a difference in the, in the uptake and the cycling of calcium in that. I just wondered if you could kind of address that a little bit, because I always found that very fascinating and I think back to that quite often. Yeah, the, uh, the broadleaf plants have, it, it have a lot more calcium in them and mostly if you know if you've been producing alfalfa you know how much calcium is in alfalfa and, and the grasses uh, you know like wheat is, is about probably 0.3 or 0.4 alfalfa be 2.2 or something like that maybe maybe 1.8 and it's just a lot more uh, Calcium and magnesium in the broad leaves than there is in the in the grasses and mm -hmm. and that, that and so what you're doing you're recycling calcium magnesium up to put back on the exchange complex to, to hopefully to, to reduce the nitrogen or hydrogen that's uh, going on the exchange yeah. complex. Mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, soils like ours that tend to drop in pH, especially when you're putting the commercial fertility on there. The, the higher broad leaves can help buffer that just a little bit. Yeah, and, and that's one of the comments that, that, you know, some people say with the more healthy soil, their pH comes up and mm -hmm. well, it, it kind of makes sense what we're doing. Yeah. Number, number one is that, you know, when we talk about leaching, uh, Keith, uh, nitrate, we always worry about nitrate going down, but you can't have an anion going, going down without carrying a cation with it. And the cation that usually goes is calcium. And, and uh, I, have, I have a customer in Illinois that sends his tiling water. And, and when we run uh, sulfur on the water, uh, we also run calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. So I, I treat and I look on the, our data to see how much calcium is going on. And it's just amazing, the higher the, higher the anions are in that solution, the more calcium, magnesium, more sodium is going going out with it yeah so that's a recycling back that we're talking about okay great last question ray um you know there's getting to be more and more talk about these carbon trading programs you know the indigo carbon program and there's there's going to be more and more talk more opportunities for people to get paid to sequester carbon down the road i think can you talk a little bit about how viable you think that is? How, how fast can we increase our organic matter in our soils? Because you, you see, you know, thousands and thousands of soil samples. What, what's, a, what's a reasonable amount of organic matter that we can expect to add to a soil? If we're, if we're really doing things right, you know, cover crops, diverse crop rotation, those sorts of things. How, how fast can we build soil organic matter and, and thus carbon and, and then potentially get paid for it down the road? Yeah, the, the, the speed of uh, building carbon or sequestering carbon in the soil depends really on the, the whole management system. And, and anybody that's mob grazing cover crops is gonna raise uh, the organic matter a lot faster than somebody that's just doing cash crops. And, and on, on our farm where we did the no-till, 
we've raised the, the organic matter up about 1% in about 15 years. And then uh, now it's kind of steady. And, and so then we got to go to the next step, which I think is putting more livestock into that, into that system to be able to stomp the, the carbon down in the soil. And, and uh, I was trying to remember uh, Paul Yasa's plots over at, on the Rogers Memorial Farm. We did uh, carbon measurements down to six feet on his plots. And, and what I remember was in, in about 25 or 28 years of no-till, we had 10 tons more carbon in the soil uh, where he had no-tilled that time. Now, when, when you think about that, you had to take the, I think it's, I can't remember the number, uh, 44 divided by 12, uh, 3.6. You take 3.6 times that carbon number, 10 tons, and that's the tons of carbon dioxide you, you trapped in the soil. So my quick calculations on if we could increase organic matter in 1% uh, in, in the top six, seven inches of soil, we've, we've captured a ton of carbon or uh, 3.6 tons of carbon dioxide. And, and so I don't know how they're, you know, how the things are going to come out, but, but there should be some compensation for people to, yeah. to get paid. Now, for you that's been doing this great job already, how are you going to get paid? Can you get more, you know, more or get a carbon in the cell? Yeah, that's just it. There's almost a penalty for having done done the good work earlier. No, don't don't say that. You you just <laughs> reap more benefits than other people have. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's I always I always have to bring that up because don't worry if you if you got a good soil, don't worry if you don't get paid for your carbon. You're, you're still doing you're still doing better stuff anyway, and, yeah, and uh, yeah. you know we've talked about saving soil in Nebraska, Great Plains. Most places are resource is soil, and then to go with that's the water and yeah, yeah. God, that's, we have to do all these things to save those two things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Ray, thank you so much for answering these questions. Now let's kind of open it up and uh, catch some questions from the audience here. Yeah, first one uh, actually is for Keith. Was that cover crop um, fertilized applied to the, that vetch or was it just nitrogen from the previous cover crop? Yeah, so good question. The We probably, I can't remember, I'd have to ask Brian for sure. We probably put maybe 30 or 40 pounds of nitrogen on that buckwheat uh, back in August when we planted it. But I mean, we harvested a decent crop of buckwheat so I'm convinced that there was no carryover nitrogen between the triticale and the buckwheat would have taken up any applied nitrogen. So I'm, I'm thinking that 227 pounds was primarily produced through fixation from that legume. There would have been some pulled out of organic matter and just being cycled, but the vast majority of that uh, would have been fixed uh, from that legume uh, vetch crop. Okay. Um, Ray, the reference guide for what would be considered normal kind of ranges on the Haney tests. Um, is there a plan to make those ranges region specific or ag land versus grassland prairie? Do you know anything about that? Uh, I, I, I don't know too much about it. Uh, I'm always hesitant to, to put too many categories on there. We got some on there, of course, but uh, we know that the regions are going to be different. And, and I think uh, at this point in time, a lot of people have to do some of their own calibration. And, and as we gather more information, and, and, and uh, I, I don't know if it's ready for announcement or not, but we're going to get some help in our laboratory to do some of these things. So uh, coming pretty soon. So, so we'll, we'll be on the effort to try, to try to make things kind of match different territories. But that's a good question. And it's one I need to know that that you guys are interested in that. Okay, uh, is there an ideal time of year to collect a sample to test for PLFA respiration and Haney test? The, uh, in, in course, I'm a laboratory, so the best time to take is right now. You know? <laughs> so uh, uh, Haney, Haney told us that the best time to take his test is when you're making plans for your next crop. And, and so it's kind of like a regular soil test. The PLFA is, is we're trying to get a picture of the microbial life in the soil. That means when plants are growing, 
So we kind of advise on the PLFA, the best time to take a sample is a month to six weeks after emergence of the crop, the plants that you're kind of working with. So, so there's two different times for the two tests. And of course we get a lot of Haney tests this time of year too, but uh, uh, in, in if you're trying to make plans on fertility, now if you're tracking fertility and those things, that's a little different, but uh, and the best time to take it would be take the same time each year. It's sometime when you got time, so you can do it about the same time. So you got a you better tracking time. And if you take some in the spring and then you take it in the fall and you get more variability. And if you're trying to track changes, take them the same time each year. Okay. Uh, which soil health principle would you prioritize if you were a rancher or dry land farmer? averaging 10 to 14 annual precip, many thanks. And maybe Keith, you have uh, an opinion on that as well? The, 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 what, what the grass needs is rest. And if you, uh, so you, you have to get the animals off of the grass for a period of time. And then when you got 10 inches of rain, it might be you graze that, kind of mob graze it heavily for just a short time and then they're off, off for another year. And, and uh, as you have more rainfall, then it can maybe be like on, where my farm is in Southeast Nebraska, we're, we're hoping that we got 16 pastures now in our native grass. And, and uh, so I hope we'll have two months of rest so that uh, the grass can regrow and, and reestablish root system. And, and, it, and you got to leave about half of it out there in that grass. Or if you graze down more than that, then you start destroying the root system and then it takes time for that root system to grow back. And in in the root system has to grow back about 30% every year. And so, you, so that's why it needs that rest anyway. And when plants regrow, if you cut them off, you, you know, graze them off or hay it, then the, the plants regrow from the carbohydrate, carbohydrate stored in that root system. So, so if, you, if you keep the grass growing and, and you only take half of it, then, you, then it's growing from the material that's left on top, not, not sucking out stuff from the root system. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think what Ray just talked about there, you know, covers a couple of the soil health principles. Number one, keep the, keep the soil covered. And if you graze your pastures off too much, it's not going to be covered enough. And so it's really important that you keep that ground cover on there. Number one, to be able to take advantage of the rain when it comes. Because it doesn't matter if you get 10 to 14 inches of rain or 30 to 40 inches of rain, it only matters what you get in the ground. And uh, when I was in California, I heard, heard one guy, uh, he mentioned, he, when somebody asked him how much rain he got, he says, the answer I like to give is all of it. I got <laughs> all of it. <laughs> because it really only matters what you can get in the ground. And if you don't have the ground covered and if you don't have that living root out there, it's going to be really hard to do. So Ray's exactly right. It's all about managing that grazing and giving that rest time. Yeah. Uh, what are the organic acids measured from root exudates, Ray? What What are they? Yeah. Um, you know, the organic the three, acids. Yeah, the three we we use in the Haney extract, the H3 extract, are malic, oxalic, and citric acids. And and. Uh, I haven't studied the exudates that, that rich all kinds of the kind of uh, organic acids in carbohydrates that they leak out. So I don't have many of those names, uh, but uh, there's, they've, told, they've told me about 90 or more different compounds are leaked out by the roots. And the, and the plants leak out compounds to feed certain microbes to bring certain nutrients to the plant. And I think that the, the pl different plants have different requirements, so they, they leak out different uh, compounds to encourage a certain a group of microbes to uh, dissolve those nutrients and bring them to the plants. That's a very interesting thing. I don't understand it very well, but uh, I'm learning. Okay. Uh, what would you consider the value of compost slurry or compost vermicast extract straight after aeration for humus building? The, the, the extract is, and I don't know, uh, I refer everybody to Dr. David Johnson in New Mexico to know what, what is the best way to do it. 
but I but I had a just a little curious thing with a farmer customer from Montana. It was he wanted a fertilizer test on a water sample he sent in, and and I said, well, there's no fertilizer value to this, and and uh, he said, well, he said, yeah, and I said, what is it? He said, well, it's compost tea, and he said it has to have fertilizer value in it because when I spray it on my plants, they grow like mad. Well, I, it it made me understand that what the compost is doing and what David Johnson talks about is having a compost long enough that we get the growth, the plant growth hormones produced that increases the plants to grow. So the tea is, is and that's kind of what you'd have to test is how good does your plants grow after when you put this on because it, 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 in the longer you kind of compost, it seems like the better that or if you get the fungi up, then the better that is. And, and that's about all I know about it, but it's, it's one that I think there's a lot of people interested in it. And we're doing some things with phospholipid fatty acid tests in our lab, and it's just amazing that right now I don't have any more to say about it than that, but, but we're finding out things uh, that how it reacts with our soils. And no, I might, I might just jump in on that just a little bit. You know, what Ray was talking about, um, and, and I see that uh, Christine Jones is actually listening in here uh, from Australia. So we may have to twist Christine's arm and try to get her on a webinar down the road here. But she talks extensively about, you know, the auto inducers that are being uh, produced by those microbes. And, and those are those hormones or those signalers that are, yeah. are, are causing the plants to grow. And so it's not it's not a biological effect so much as a chemical effect, but it's chemicals that are being produced by the biology. And uh, it's just a fascinating topic. And uh, if you have our soil health resource guide, uh, Christine Jones has a great article in there talking about the auto inducers and, and, and the effect that they have on plants and, and that that's probably what you're seeing when you put a compost extract that has almost no fertility in it, but yet you see a, a fertility type effect uh, it's not coming from the fertility you're putting on. It's coming from uh, the, the stimulus that you're giving the plant. So uh, we'll have to reach out to Dr. Jones and see if we can get her on uh, down good. the road. Noah, you're on mute. See that here. <laughs> Ray, in your crystal ball, where do you see the direction of soil and water testing heading in terms of specific testing criteria and methods? And kind of to piggyback on that, do you think that ag retail will change how fertilizer is produced so that the salinity and other components are more friendly to the environment and long-term sustainability of agriculture? That is, that's a pretty tough question to answer because I, I got lots of biases on what, uh, what I think ag industry is, does sometimes to us. But uh, the industry is very interested in the, uh, the biologicals and you see a lots of different compounds being being uh, promoted and produced so I think uh, I think the egg industry does see some of that uh, and then then at the same time I hear the stories of farmers that call and they can't make any money and they're putting all this stuff on and and their soil tests are high and then they're insisting on still doing things and and so so we really it's it's a it's a long long deal of education, and and, uh, and then we I want my I want the farmers to understand what's going on, and then I'd like to have the ag industry be honest enough to uh, to work with the farmers on uh, the the Haney test I think is going to continue to be very important. We're doing uh, some other tests, and and then I keep wondering what else can we do. Because, it, because we're doing the aggregate stability, we're, do, we're doing a pox that, that permanganate carbon test that not sure how to interpret that yet. Uh, we do some enzymes. And then, and then the carbon, the total carbon, uh, total organic carbon, total nitrogen, uh, those that we do in the soil, uh, there's more interest on that all the time. And, and, and uh, I guess, and then you know, another test that we're trying to get developed this summer is humus, because we talk a lot about uh, the humus. And so we're just going to kind of keep working on some of these things, and I got to get people in that can understand things better than I do, and so I can kind of sit back and take a little time to 
to work with you guys. Great, Ray. You would, you would know what to do if you weren't coming up with a new test about every other year to do, would you? Uh, no, it's a, uh, it, Keith. It's and it drives some of the people in the lab nuts because you guys call and say, "Well, can you do this?" And well, yeah, I, you know. But then, <laughs> then the computer program doesn't work, and the and the people in the login room don't understand, and and so so it's a. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination to get some of these things done, but it's Absolutely. fun answering your questions and trying to trying to get some answers on some new things that are coming along. So Ray, you mentioned uh, the Haney test there. Uh, Brian says, I want to associate soil health with forage quality. I expect forage quality to get better as the soil health improves. Is the Haney test or the PLFA test better for this, or is the conventional test uh, going to be just fine for that purpose. I think uh, I think the Haney test uh, because the biological system is what's going to to make that forage better quality, and and uh, then and of course you got to manage the forage to get the good quality too. But but uh, the Haney test probably would be the best way. And in, in, in when you get if you can if you can see visually that you're doing a better job, you might just go to conventional testing, but but to see that CO2 respiration and to see the water extractable carbon nitrogen, which is the food for the microbes, I think is very helpful in understanding how healthy your soil is. You know, PLFA, that shows you the microbes there, but uh, it really doesn't help you on input costs and those kind of things. Okay. I know we're running just a little late here, so I'll probably take this as kind of the last question. Um, Andy says, what happens when you don't let the compost, let the compost long enough? Do you still get the same organic acids? Keith, do you know, or Ray, do you have any experience with that? And, and, and I, I don't have any. I, the, my logic says uh, from what, what Dr. Uh, Johnson has told us, that the longer you keep it, it seems like the better the stuff is, but, but I don't have any more clue than that. Yeah, I mean, there, there could be several concerns. You know, one would be if you're composting materials that would have, you know, some sort of pathogens or toxicity in it, if you don't go through the full composting process, you may not break those down, uh, particularly weed seeds. I mean, we compost our seed cleanings and screenings, and so we need to make sure that's getting heated up enough to at least kill that weed seed. And even when we compost manure, you know, we want to make sure all those weed seeds are composted. So that, that would be one thing. Uh, but again, if you're looking at, you know, trying to grow both biology and the auto inducers, uh, it, it, it's similar to, you know, if you put a cake in the oven and, and only cooked it for, you know, 10 minutes instead of 20 minutes, it's, it's going to come out and it's not going to be done. It's going to be a little raw. So um, I would think with compost, you know, you're not going to get the full benefit. Now, if you spread that, you're still going to get the carbon that's in there. And that carbon boost is one important part of, of using compost or manure. Uh, but the biology just isn't going to be fully, uh, fully functional, and you're not going to get the benefit that you would have if you'd have let it go the full term. Keith, uh, you, you mentioned something that made me realize that a lot of people will turn feedlot manure three times and call it compost, and it's still manure. And and uh, when when we're talking about compost or the compost tea, it's kind of like what the Johnson Sioux uh, compost thing is, where it's it's aerobic uh, in those little cases and not a big one row of stuff that you have to turn every day for yep. a couple of weeks and that kind of thing. So so it, we really have to be careful when we're, when we're comparing things, what we're talking about. Yeah, and no, that actually would be a great topic for a future webinar is the Johnson Sioux method of composting because it is, is really quite unique. Yes, yeah. it is. Well, with that, I think we're gonna close here. Ray, thank you so much for your time uh, and answering these questions. It's uh, always great to have an expert with us that knows what they're doing, especially one that's as be, close be, as you be are. Careful, be careful, no one. <laughs> so with that, we're gonna conclude. Um, next week, we've got Brett Peshek is gonna be on. We're going to be talking about overseeding some Bermuda grass. So if you've got thin uh, stands of that, or even maybe more aggressive stands, how to diversify those pastures. So with that, we'll conclude. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Ray. And you guys have a great rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, Thanks. for joining us.